This is Karen Alton and it's an Interqual News interview with Buddy Giovinazzo of the rather amazing film A Night of Nightmares. Okay Buddy, thank you very much for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about your film please? Well my film is a, um, for me it's a, it's a genre film. My films in the past haven't been genre films. This is a supernatural thriller and it's about young people, a guy who has a blog, an internet blog, and what he does is he showcases musical talent, undiscovered musical talent. And he comes across this singer named Ginger, and she's got an amazing voice. And he sets up an interview with her, he tracks her down, and she's living in California, staying up in the mountains. He goes up to interview her. And during the course of the interview, she turns out to be a beautiful woman, and they have a certain chemistry. And um, later that night, they get a visit from um, a stalker. She's actually been living in this cabin to avoid this guy, and he appears with a gun. And you think it's going to be a domestic dr drama, and uh, it, it has a violent twist, and they wind up killing him in self-defense. And uh, they're waiting for the cops, they call the police, and of course they're in the mountains, so it takes a long time for the police to come. And during the course of them hanging out, they get to know each other better, and they begin to fall in love. And then the door slams shut in the house. They're waiting outside on the porch. And when they go inside, the body's gone. Oh. With no sign of how the body got up, because it was a very bloody death. And so it becomes a supernatural thriller in this house, these two people trying to survive. And he's a, he's a realist. He doesn't believe in spirituality. He doesn't believe in anything that he can't see and touch. And she believes in the other world. She's a very spiritual. She believes in nature and spirits. So they have this, this, I wouldn't call it an argument, but they have this complete difference of opinion of any time something happens, he's got a rational excuse, and she thinks it's spiritual. How did you come up with the characters and the writing and so forth? I actually didn't come up with this character. This is one of the first times I took on a film that I didn't originate. I was given the screenplay, and I didn't want to do the film. I read it as a favor and I fell in love with the main character, Ginger, the singer, and I just thought, wow, I, I love this character and I felt I could do something with this character in a film. So it was a completely different script in that it was a lot bigger. It wasn't a character script, it was more special effects. Mm. You know, things flying through the house and, and spirits and ghosts, and, and I wasn't interested in that. I was interested more in the two characters being together, so the producers allowed me to put my own fingerprints into the project, so I was able to do a rewrite and also write it to the location that I knew we were, we were going to be able to get. We couldn't really shoot in studios. We didn't have a big enough budget. So they let me pretty much fine tune it. And then I, I sort of made it my own and then uh, directed it. How did you actually fine tune it? How did you make it you? I made it, you know, basically what I try to do in all my films is make my characters realistic and believable, which means I watch so many films where characters do things and I just think like, why are they doing such a stupid thing? Or why is he going into that room when he knows the killer's in that room? And so I always try to like make my films be more realistic. I, I play every character and I say, what would I do if I was in this situation? That's not to say that people don't do different things, of course, but there are certain behaviors that are just universal in human nature. Mm -hmm. So I always try to bring that into the forefront so that when an audience is watching it, if they have that question of why did he go there, you're, you're really much, you're not paying attention to the drama. So that's one of the things I did was try to make it more realistic. The other thing I did was try to make it a love story because I think that's something that an audience can really relate to and then when creepy things start to happen to lovers it becomes more powerful and it has more of an effect. How do you want the audience to respond to what's happening between the lovers at this time? That's actually, it's what's happened with the audience that we've had the screenings for, it's exactly what I was hoping for. They fall in love with the characters and they want to see them come together because they're so different. And at the beginning, it looks like there's no shot of them coming together. She, For instance, one of the first things she says to him is, I hope you don't mind, but my boyfriend's going to come by a little bit later, you know, and just he, he'll hang out with us. And he thinks, you know, great, that's cool. You know, and he's trying to be professional, so he forgets about any other intentions. And then later she tells him, you know, he says, you know, who was that guy? Was that your boyfriend? And she tells him, I, never, I didn't even have a boyfriend. I just told you that so you wouldn't hit on me. So... It's, it's very human, it's very real in certain situations. And, so, and the characters are, are really good, they're, really, uh, they're very sincere, so people like them. How did you go about working with the actors? That was, um, we had a week of rehearsals, and then we just, we went through scene by scene and just tried to take out the bad stuff. Um, 
You know, the thing with, with a film, with most films, it's not so much all the good stuff that you put in, it's taking out the bad stuff, because a lot of films have really good moments, and those moments are always weakened because their bad moments aren't taken out or aren't improved. And I find that's much more important to take out the bad moments than to throw in a bunch of good moments. I think every, every good film needs some moments, some three to five really good moments where people think, yeah, I get it. But I think what's more important is taking out the bad moments. So working with the actors, we would just say, you know, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't seem, you know, we, we'd, I basically would throw questions up. Why is this guy doing that? What do you think? What would you do? Mm. And so we just try and fine tune the behavior so we make it as, as realistic as we can. And obviously you've got a very good cast, haven't you? Yeah. Mark Center, Alyssa Dowling. Mark Center I saw for the first time in Red, White and Blue and I was just blown away by him. I thought he was such a great actor. And um, I was really lucky to get him. He, he agreed to do the film as a favor. We didn't know each other, but we met through friends. And he liked the script and we got along good. And so we got along very well. So he, he just said, you know, at one point, he says, okay, I'm in. Alyssa Dowling was an actress that I'd known about for a while. I hadn't seen much of her work, but what I did see, I saw she had something, she had a spark. She's got these incredible blue eyes that are just amazing, very unique. And I wanted the chance to work with somebody and you know, bring her into a role that she's never done before, and try and take her into a more profound and more deeper type of role. And how do they interact with the house? I, I gather there's been quite a lot to do with the sound design and the actual kind of character of what's going on with the, the area they're in. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the house is a character. It's, uh, it's like my first feature, Combat Shock. My first feature had a major sound design and I just felt that the sound and what people hear has an effect on what they feel. Just like we're, we're here in this room and there's some type of generator going on that we hear the whole time. It has an effect. In some ways, if that generator was off, this room would probably feel bigger. The fact is the room feels smaller because we have this constant motorized sound going. So I like to use sound in rooms to create you know, the, the space of the room and give every room its own characterization or its own personality. For instance, it could be a warmer sound or a colder sound or a natural sound or an industrial sound. So I, I used a lot of that in the house. And the house was in the mountains. We used a lot of wind. We used a lot of cold sounding effects. And, and we also just used a lot of uh, you know, surreal sound design because it is sort of a haunted house. You could do that in a haunted house. But how did you actually design the kind of surrealism to it? We would just... Um, you know, when the characters would be talking about personal stuff, when he's like trying to find out about her life, and, and uh, ex she's talking about ex-boyfriends and different things, one of them was a shaman, you know, the sound would be very warm, it would be more naturalistic, it would be like maybe a light wind in the background. Um, when creepy things were happening, there would be more like, not generator sounds, but there would be, you know, the wind sound wouldn't be a natural wind anymore. It would be treated and it would have, it would have a very strange sound, it wouldn't be a natural sound that you'd ever hear in nature. And we tried to make that thick, so that it was almost like there was another presence in the room. It was not just the two main characters, but there was something that we didn't see in this room. So that's pretty much how I would work with sound design in this film. Wow. What kind of sounds actually mean something to you in particular? Is there a particular sound you associate with a feeling you often have? Or? It's, it's different. Um, Listen, this sound, I find, like, this sound could be in one of my movies. This is the type of sound I would put definitely in one of my films. And when we go from this room back on in this hallway to go back, it would be a completely different sound. And I love that. I love getting characters in a movie going from one room to the next and then designing what does the second room sound like. Is it thicker? This is a very thick sound. As we get closer upstairs, the sound is going to get lighter and lighter because we're getting closer to the light, we're getting closer to fresh air. So that's my approach to sound design, is trying to imagine what do these things feel like? Because sound to me has more to do with feeling than with what we're hearing. So that's, that's my approach. You know, it's, it's, it's Lynchian. I learned it from David Lynch, from watching David Lynch movies. Because the sound design, you could, you could almost watch a David Lynch movie without the picture and still feel something. Very much so. It, it becomes a very emotional thing, doesn't it? It's, you know, the, the entire idea of hearing the mother's voice and going back to all that kind it, of stuff. It's fantastic. I, I, it's one of the things I love because it's very creative and it's something that most people don't understand, so nobody interferes with that either. So, like producers or companies or anything, they pretty much give you free reign on sound design because they don't understand it. So I like that. What would you like the audience to take from this? 
Um, you know, as opposed to my other films, which were much more hard-hitting and social, uh, social dramas, this is much more of an entertainment thing. This has got some scares, it's got some humor, it's got some warmth. And this is, for me, one of the very few times that I've done anything that's entertaining. Because the other stuff that I've done was more thought-provoking and more hard-hitting, and it left people feeling a little bit weird at the end, you know. I wanted to always, in the past, leave people leaving the theater with, like, thoughts. What happens after the film? what happens to this character when the film is over but I didn't you know the, all the all the all the questions weren't answered and I like leaving the audience with questions at the end of the film this film pretty much is self-contained and it's, it's definitely much more entertaining and we made we knew that going in we weren't trying to make something thought-provoking we had a very limited budget and we knew the genre was a really strong genre. So I just said, let me just service this genre. Let me just put in the things that people that would go to this type of film would want to see. They, they want some humor, they want some warmth, and they want to be scared. And we tried to put all those things in it. For what it's worth, when we've been doing Vox Pops and people have been coming out, it really works. Well done. Seriously, yeah, people, people are like really it. happy. Yeah, people do like it, so I'm happy for that. And we're looking for a distributor now, so this was the second screening we've had. We just finished the film in July. So we're still pretty fresh going out with the film. So we have a few more festivals. Hopefully we can sell it, and then it will come out in theaters sometime. Where are you going to be at festivals? Next festival is going to be in Germany, not too far away from where I live. It's going to be at the Oldenburg Film Festival. And we're still waiting to hear back from the Paris International Horror Film Festival and Sitges in Spain. Wow. Really, really good luck. Thanks. Seriously, you're fab at what you do, and I hope, I really well, hope. For God's sake, pick it up, somebody. It's fantastic. It's going to be. It's buddy. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome.